Do you know what this is and why it's important in genetic genealogy research? If you don't, or even if you do, stick around and discover the full answer to my initial question. Howdy, I'm Andy Lee with Family History Fanatics, and I've got a treat for you today. This is actually one of the comments. I'm not going to say it's one of the comments. It is a comment or question that I have gotten dozens, if not hundreds of times in our comments section, as well as whenever I'm teaching seminars or our live streams or even just emails. And the question is, why is a chromosome browser important? I have seen and I've heard from lots of different people, a chromosome browser isn't needed most of the time. And I agree, a chromosome browser isn't needed most of the time. But being able to read 18th century German scripts is not needed most of the time. And if you don't know what 18th century German scripts are, you need to look it up and see. I didn't realize there were so many of them until I actually had to delve into some of them. But it sure is helpful if you know how to read them when you're looking at 18th century German documents. It's not that a chromosome browser is needed for most or even a significant amount of questions that we may have in genetic genealogy. What I think it boils down to, why is a chromosome browser needed, is your segment data of a match is the equivalent of an original record. Because your DNA is a record of your DNA, but it's really your DNA compared to somebody else's DNA, that match, that is a record of a relationship. What that relationship is, we don't know, but that is a record of a relationship. And so I would argue that that segment data is the equivalent of an original record. So you can see here, we have birth certificates, we have marriage certificates, we have death certificates, we have war enlistment certificates, we have segment data through a chromosome browser. All of these are original records that tell us specific things. They don't necessarily tell us everything, but they tell us specific things. They contain particular bits of information within them. Most people who say that a chromosome browser is not needed most of the time, which they're right, it's not, will then point out the fact that you're probably going to use your match list most, and you're going to be able to find lots of information from your match list. Well, a match list is an index of segment data. So if you have an index of birth certificates, you happen to have an index of segment data. We happen to call it a match list. So if we're looking here, I've got Bible circuit baptisms, a index that's been compiled online. I have, I don't even know what all of these are. I think there's a death index from one county. There's a voter registration index that were in printed books by these different entities. And there is a match list here from Ancestry. And I'll admit, I'm going to pick on Ancestry a little bit today, but let me also say I, I should pick on Living DNA as well because they don't provide a chromosome browser either. But in any case, these indexes have taken some of the information from that original record and compiled it so that it is easier to digest or search through and able to find what it is specifically that you're looking for. So it's not that these indexes are not helpful. And in some cases, these indexes actually contain all of the information or what we hope is all of the information that was in that original record. We use indexes all the time. In fact, you probably spend more time looking through indexes than any other genealogical document. And that makes sense because we're looking for dozens, hundreds, thousands of different ancestors. And if we were looking at items one at a time, it would take forever. And before there was an index, that was how people had to do genealogy. And guess what? There wasn't much genealogy actually done because it's really tedious and time consuming to look through every single record. But with an index and people who have made records or compiled records figured this out long ago. Hey, if we find an index or if we create an index for this, it is going to be more useful and people are going to be able to find the information they need, whether that be for legal purposes, whether that be for genealogical purposes, 
Whether that be just to satisfy their own curiosity, doesn't matter. An index is a awesome document that makes finding other documents much easier. And that's why we spend so much time with them. But nobody, I've never heard any genealogist say, you don't need to look at original records because we have indexes. Or you spend most of your time in indexes, so you don't need to look at the original records. Or most of the questions you have can be solved by looking at the proper index. Yet all of those statements could actually be true. I have solved genealogical problems as far as relationships to a very confident degree simply by looking at indexes and figuring out how different people fit in them, how families fit them in together, all that stuff from indexes. But I would never advocate not looking at original documents. And in fact, even though I had solved those problems fairly confidently just from the index, I took the next step and looked at the original records. Why is that? Genealogy standards require you to look at original records. It's not an option. If you are doing an exhaustive search, you will not stop at the index. You will go the next step and pull those original records. Why do you want to pull those original records? Because there may be one other information on that record that was not contained within the index. Two, the index may have been created wrong. In other words, they may have mixed up the grantor or the grantee. They may have the wrong person listed as the father. They may have a date that is incorrect. And that is why you are looking at that. And three, it is to verify all of the other information that can help corroborate whatever question you have. You may have this specific question that you think this index answers, but once you look at the original record, there's other information that mm, maybe discounts what that answer was. So it is not sufficient to just look at indexes, even though that index may apparently solve your genealogy problem. Genealogy standards tell us that we should go and look at the original records. Because of that then, genealogists should be using a chromosome browser. In other words, they should be looking at the original record of matches. It's that simple. That is why a chromosome browser is important. It is the original record of matches. It contains the most data about that match. The index is just a condensed portion of that information. And so let me go through and talk about some of the things that you can do with the chromosome browser that you can't do with just a match list. In other words, what are some of these specialty functions that a chromosome browser allows you to do that a match list is not going to allow you to do? Triangulation. Triangulation is a way to show that three or more people, because of sharing the same segment on the same chromosome, have a common ancestor. Unlike a match, this one is a almost definite match because it eliminates almost all false matches. And so you can know that these matches all group together in searching for that common ancestor. It is confirming any group of matches, three, four, five, six, seven, ten, twenty, share a most recent common ancestor, as long as they meet the requirements of triangulation. And I have done many videos on this channel about triangulation, so you can see how that can be used for your genetic genealogy. Painting. When I say painting, it could mean lots of different things, but thanks to DNA Painter, it's really primarily focused on one thing, and that is assigning segments to specific ancestors. This is extremely valuable because once you've assigned segments to specific ancestors, any new matches unknown that happen to have that segment in common, if you know whether they're on your maternal or paternal side, or even if you don't, but you know hey, it's going to be one of these two ancestral lines because they share that segment that matches with that location on the chromosome. How much less research do you have to do simply because 
you know a specific ancestral line that you need to research for this ancestor, as opposed to eh, maybe it's this half over here. Attached to painting, or I guess uh, at a corollary to that, is visual phasing. If you have siblings and you have their DNA, you can paint which segments of your DNA came from which of your four grandparents. And this is just with your siblings' DNA and a few known matches. This is, again, just like with painting specific ancestors, now throughout your entire chromosome, you at least know which grandparent any of these people fall under. That is a powerful tool, and a match list by itself is not going to give you that. Segment patterns. Now, when I say this, what I'm talking about is how the size and location of segments throughout their genome line up. There's been some recent research, both academically and within the genetic genealogy community, about how we can use chromosome patterns. Primarily, we are focused on close relationships. And I think the first one really that I remember looking at was Kitty Cooper, who was doing some research on the quarter relationships. Grandparents, aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews. No, half siblings. Yes, nieces, nephews falls in with the aunts, uncles. And what she showed in this research from a few years ago, just by gathering some data from people who had tested, is that while this group of grandparents aunts and uncles and half siblings share the same amount of DNA, how many segments they have help determine which of those three relationships they are. I've done some further research on that. In fact, I was inspired by hers and gathered even more data and expanded that to be looking at things like what's the longest internal segment with each one of these relationships and how they, they fall out. And you can start to see patterns where you can actually distinguish between Paternal, maternal, grandparent, aunt, uncle, niece, nephew, what is the other, half sibling. You can actually determine even further as far as the relationship by the more little bits of data that you have, which you're getting from a chromosome browser, from this segment data. There's more that's ongoing. This might be able to be expanded out to first cousins, maybe even second cousins, that we can determine simply by how that segment layout is on the chromosome browser we can see what kind of a relationship that is. Another thing is it's really useful for identifying endogamy. If you have somebody who is from an endogamous population and you're looking at this match, it's actually going to be pretty apparent from that chromosome pattern. You're going to have much smaller segments, more spread out throughout the chromosomes, rather than having a few large segments that add up to whatever you're sharing with them. This can be really useful because endogamy, I think, is the bane of genetic genealogy. And knowing whether or not you have that could help you from going down some rabbit holes that are going to just take you forever to climb out of. That is something that you see with a chromosome browser easily. Next is pileup regions. Pileup regions, I've done videos on this also, are regions that from a population, certain parts of the genome have really become ubiquitous. Not necessarily everybody in that population has them, but the vast majority of people have them. And so they share them down. And what you see with a chromosome browser and being able to browse that segment data is as you're looking at segments, you may see that, okay, I have three matches with this segment. I have five matches with this segment. I have two matches with this segment. I have eight matches with this segment. I have 75 matches with this segment. Well, that should clue you in right away that one of two things is happening. You have a pileup region. In other words, you're all part of this population that's received this same bit of DNA. Not because you're closely related, but because 500 or 1,000 or more years ago, everybody in that population group had that DNA. This is important because it identifies matches you're likely not going to find a genealogical connection to, simply because they're just too old. It may be a significant amount of DNA, but it may be a significant amount because... Everybody in that population has that. And it's not that you're related in the last five generations, but you're related 20 generations ago or 50 generations ago. If you know that, you can avoid trying to go in and start researching each of these that you really are not likely to find a genealogical connection to. Now, those are four things that a chromosome browser does that you cannot do from a match list. Now, some of them, depending on what segment information is said, for instance, how many segments, what the longest segment is, 
might be helpful in figuring those out, but a chromosome browser is always going to be superior to a simple match list that just tells you the number of segments for any of those four items. Again, the chromosome browser really represents the original DNA match record. As genealogists, if we are supposed to be looking at the original records whenever possible, then we need a chromosome browser. If a company wants to say that they provide a comprehensive set of tools and they don't provide a chromosome browser, even though it is not used for the vast majority of your genealogy questions, they are not providing a comprehensive tool. I have a separate video linked in the description box below where I discuss my frustration with two companies that do not currently provide a chromosome browser. Hope you like that little rant. I've been meaning to do that for a while. If you want to see how you can look at different matches in a chromosome browser, then you can watch this video up here. Be sure to subscribe to our channel. Tell us what you think about chromosome browsers in the comments below.